So yes, we're up to the fourth beatitude. If you've been paying attention, the first, the beatitudes, there's nine of them. They're broken into three sections. Uh, so the first three are to do with your state of being. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. It's Jesus is talking to a whole bunch of people, Jews, who are under the attention of the Romans, um, and these people would find themselves in those situations. They are poor. They are, they are poor. They don't have cash. They don't, oh, well, to an extent, they're, they're, they're ruled by the Romans. Their land's been taken away from them. They're being taxed beyond the Australian government, the way the Australian government taxes us, you know, way beyond that. Uh, heavy taxes and taxed on ha- taxes on taxes uh, and finding it hard to make a living. And yet Jesus says to them, blessed are you, you are in the happy place, you are in the right place, you are in the right state of mind if you find yourself being poor but being poor in spirit. To realise you're not just deficit of cash, you're not deficit of land, but you are deficit of being right with God. There's a dissension, there's a difference, a gap between you and the goodness of God. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn. And the people would find themselves in mourning as the Romans just told them what to do. They were given some freedom, but being under the rule of somebody else, when you've been promised the land, is, it's, it's hard to deal with. We find that hard in Australia where we're given a lot of freedom, but they would have found that hard to deal with. And Jesus is saying, well, blessed are you. You're in the happy place. You're in the right place. If not only do you mourn over that which you have lost, physically but over that which you have lost spiritually that the gap between you and God you mourn over that and you want to see that corrected and he says blessed are the meek the powerless and the the Jews are powerless the Romans rule the roost there's Pharisees and there's Sadducees and they get a little bit of leeway and all the rest of it and they are given some freedoms but they are powerless to make a difference and Jesus says blessed are you If you're not just powerless to make a difference in this world by political means or by financial means, but blessed are you if you find yourself powerless and and you don't assume, don't assume to have power over other people. That you find, you've humbled yourself, you've brought yourself back and you find yourself on an even plane with others. There are three things, a state of being. And the fourth one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the fifth and the sixth is another triad. It's another group of three which starts to talk about how you're going to react in those circumstances. So the first three, you find yourself in these situations. Now, how are you going to react to those situations? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, the whole idea of hunger and thirsting, I think in Australia, gee, I don't know if I've ever found myself in a situation where I've been overly hungry. Food is provided for us, like from your parents and all the rest of it. I can't think of a state in my life where I thought, where's my next meal going to come from? If I don't have this next meal, I'm going to die. Because in the days of Jesus, that would be a common experience among the people. As to where am I going to get my next meal from? How am I going to feed my family? How are we going to survive? And and that hunger and that thirst in that day and age was not about, oh, gee, my tummy's grumbling a little bit. I just saw an ad for KFC and, you know, that smell's now wafting through the room and I'm hungry and I, I, I desire to eat that. No, no, they're hungry and they're thirsting because that is what is going to sustain them. That is what they, they need that... We turn on a tap and water comes out. Isn't that amazing? Clean water comes out of a tap. In that day, you want water? You've got to go find a well. And you've got to drop a bucket down in it. And you could be walking miles to find that well to bring the water back, to wash your dishes, wash your hands, cook your food, whatever it might be. It's a different world. And so you need to understand that to hunger and thirst for something is to hunger and thirst for that which is going to sustain you that you might live, that you might continue on living. To hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
you know, hunger is one of those domineering sort of um, things, even in our day and age. When I'm hungry, I find it hard to concentrate on anything else. Anyone else in that boat? Yeah. Yeah. And when you're parched, you know, when you're dry, the first headaches start to kick in and it's like, oh, I just feel like I've got no energy and I've got to, I desire, I've got to go and get that, dr- that water, that drink. And it's what I'm looking for. And all the other distractions sort of go by the wayside. All those other desires I have, all of a sudden, chocolate doesn't look appealing when I'm thirsty. Uh, some people, maybe we can melt it and make a drink out of it. But, but when you're thirsty for water or you're hungry, all those other things that might distract you, that, that, that pull you in their direction, that tempt you, they sort of, they go by the wayside. And particularly in this day and age where it's to survive, you forget to begin to forget about other things and you focus in on, I need to find food and I need to find water. Again, I said I've never found myself in that situation. In Australia, we're very fortunate. But in other countries, they would understand this. That all desires go away except for that desire for food and that desire for, for, for water. And that's what Jesus is bringing our attention to here. Is blessed are those who hunger and thirst, desperately seeking sustenance, but not for food or water, but for righteousness. For righteousness. And what does righteousness mean but a right relationship with God? that I desire to have a right relationship with God and I'm going to hunger and thirst for that to the point that I'm going to push aside all other distractions that I see as the most important thing I could be looking for at this point in time is a right relationship with God. Do you find yourself in that situation where you are able to push aside the other distractions of this world, that you would seek after a right relationship with God? Now, we're not talking about self-righteousness. There, there is a difference between righteousness and self-righteousness. And you need to understand that it's not about being right. Some of us, well, lots of us like to be right, don't we? When we get in a conversation with somebody, I want to have the right answers. I don't want to be in a conversation with somebody and come out being the one who was wrong. I want to be right. And you're not being in a right relationship with God. That's not what he's talking about, being righteous, being in a right relationship with God so that I can say, hey, I'm better than everybody else. Or I'm better than, than I assumed I could be. That, that I'm, I'm now right. I'm the one you should listen to. I have all the right answers. It is not about being self-righteous. It is about being righteous. Being in the right position with God. Now, how do you gauge that? How do you judge that? Can you, can you go through it and make a checklist of all the things God has said? God said, I must do this, and I must do that, and I must do that, and I can tick them off. Because that's what the Pharisees did. And to such a point where they would protect those laws by more laws. And this is whole pharisaical idea that I was just put laws upon laws so that I can be right with God. I I can do the right things and be right in that way. And so when people ask me and they have a qualm with me, I can say, no, look, the law says this and I've done it. Big tick. That's self-righteousness. That is self-righteousness. In verse 17 of chapter 4, Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus is bringing in a kingdom. I need to understand what the difference between a kingdom and a tyrant is. You can have a tyrannical kingdom, which just means that there's a king at the top and he just tells everyone what to do. And you better abide by what he says, otherwise off with your head. But no, Jesus is introducing the kingdom of God. Do you understand what the character of God is like? That he is establishing a kingdom and in a kingdom you need to have two things. You need to have a king and a dom. No. Servants, yeah. Um, Citizens. 
Yeah, so a tyrant would have servants pretty well. That would be a good word in our English language because you serve the king. Whatever he says goes, you serve the king. But Jesus is introducing a kingdom where he wants to have citizens. Not just citizens, but sons and daughters. He's introducing a totally different kingdom to the idea of a tyrant would have. Do we see this? I want you to flick back to Exodus chapter 20, either mentally or physically, however you like it. Maybe you know Exodus 20 so well. Because Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. I want you to pick up where Jesus is going with these. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay? A tyrant might say that too, might he not? You'll have no, you will serve me and you will serve no one else. You shall not make before yourself an idol in the form of anything. A tyrant might say that. You shall not misuse my name. I, I, I feel a tyrant might say that. You give the, the, the king a bad rap and uh, off of your head. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, there's an interesting one. But what about the next six? What do the next six talk about? Honour your father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Don't covet your neighbour's house. Who are these talking about? They're not directly to God, are they? Who are they to? The people around you. They're directed to the people around you. Now, I brought this up before, is that a man comes to Jesus and says, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus says, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. There we are. One, two, three, and four. And to love your neighbor as yourself. So do you understand to be in a right relationship with God doesn't mean it's just between you and God. A right relationship between you and God is, a, is displayed in your relationships with the people around you. God is invisible. I can't claim I've ever seen his face. And if I had, I would have been burnt to a crisp. But he's not someone I can see. I can see the effects of God, but I can't see God. And so when I say I am in a right relationship with God, prove me wrong. If I just shut my mouth and do nothing, you can't prove that I'm not in a right relationship with God. Yes, yes, I can. Because a right relationship with God is not just a relationship with him, but a relationship with the people around you. It is in effect, that is how it is is displayed. It is displayed in your attitude to the people around you. How we relate to God is displayed in how we relate to people. These laws aren't just a checklist. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Yeah, I've done that. I've done that. A rich man came to Jesus and said, yeah, I've abided by all these all my life. But you're not right. You're not right in God's eyes. You are not right in a relationship you're not actually fulfilling what the kingdom looks like. You know, when Jesus came, he's coming, I'm coming to present a kingdom. It's not a kingdom that's far off. It's a kingdom that is coming now. And you know, this kingdom is going to dis- be displayed in you. He starts with his disciples. It's going to be displayed in you. To those who are listening, it's going to be displayed in you. The Beatitudes are all about what the kingdom of God looks like. And the kingdom of God is displayed in you. If you have the right attitude, it is displayed in you and how you treat the people around you. It's not just in how you treat the people around you. It's based on what you think of God. If you are in a right relationship with God, you will be in a right relationship with people. You can't be in a right relationship with God and in a wrong relationship with people. If you are in a bad relationship with people, you are in a bad relationship with God. 
They go hand in hand. Not one is greater than the other. They are both the same. You know, when, when, God, when, when God puts down the laws in Exodus chapter 20, there's not just 10 of them. In the Torah, there's like 630 laws. And there would be bylaws and all other stuff. This is just the stuff we know about. Laws are only written when, laws are, when the, idea, the ideal is broken. Cast your mind back to the Garden of Eden. Because this is where it all begins. And I believe this is where it all is going to end. The Garden of Eden is that spot where everything is good. And man walks in the garden and has a relationship with God where God walks through the garden with people. That is the ideal. That is what God considered as good in the first place. That is how he created the earth to be. That is how he created man to be. That they would rule over the animals and they would rule over the land, but not in a tyranny, but in a loving way, as in this is the kingdom of God. But it was when man decided to go his own way, that things started to go astray. That's when man decided to make for himself a kingdom and to make decisions for himself as to what is right and wrong, that then God had to put rules into place to say, no, 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 this is not what it's supposed to be like. To not eat from the tree. Right. Yeah. But God puts these things into place so that you may know that this is not the way it's meant to be. Listen to me, God says. Listen to me and I will show you what is good. And as the laws are put in place, uh, growing up I've always been given the impression that I must abide by the laws and the laws are there and it is a checklist. It's a checklist I'm terrible at and I can't tick off. Not just the Ten Commandments, but all those things to honour my parents. To, to not cover, to, well, I haven't had much trouble with murder, but we'll go, we're going to go down that line in the future. Because that's not as simple as it seems. To not steal, to not give false testimony against my neighbour. And it's been like a checklist, a checklist which hovers over me and just oppresses me and makes me think I'm just not good enough and I never will be. It strikes me that in Psalm 119, that David is able to say these words. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep the statutes and seek him with all their hearts. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Gee. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I'll praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I'll obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Psalm 100, I'm not going to go through the whole lot. It's the longest psalm, probably the longest book in the Bible, a chapter in the Bible. But the whole, every verse is about how David says, I love your law. I love your decrees. I live for your law. I live for your commandments. That sounds like someone who's just under the thumb, doesn't it? But no, because this is the kingdom of God. You're under the thumb when those laws don't actually do, aren't good laws, but these laws are perfect because these laws are the laws that display to you what the kingdom of God is meant to look like. If you could abide by those laws, you would be in the Garden of Eden. You would be in that perfect place. And the laws are good. They are good. God has not come to be a tyrant to tell you what you need to do because this is what's going to make me happy. Not just me happy. He's telling you what to do because this is going to make you happy. And not just happy for a minute, not just happy for an hour, but happy for eternity. To be joyful, to understand what life is all about. To love God is to love people. To be in a right relationship with God is to be in a right relationship with people. So what people are we talking about? Well, if you go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. I'm going to start in verse 19, in fact. We love because he first loved us. 
If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So first, love your brother. Whether that be a, a family blood brother or whether that be a, a Christian brother, love your brother. That is what the kingdom of God looks like, that you would love the person sitting next to you, your brother, your sister. Because you are all brothers and sisters in Christ. But that's not easy to do, is it? Particularly if we are self-righteous. Particularly if we think I've got it right and you've got it wrong. Particularly if we can't be meek and realise where we've come from. And realise that we are all the same. We're all as lost as each other. We all need each other to the same degree. To love your brother. But Jesus doesn't stop there. God doesn't stop there. If you go to Mark chapter 12, verse 31. Mark 12, 31 says, Love your neighbour as yourself. So not just your brother, not just the person sitting next to you, but those people you come in contact with. Who is your neighbour? Anyone you come in contact with. So love your neighbour. Love the people who live next door to you, who you run into down the street, to those people you play sport with. Don't just love the ones in your church, your Christian brother and sister. Love your neighbour. Well, that's getting a tougher task, isn't it? Because my neighbours aren't all very nice people all the time. Actually, I'm probably not a very nice person all the time in their eyes either. But that, that's, that's broadening things a little bit more. How do I go about loving my neighbour? But Jesus doesn't stop there. Well, God doesn't stop there. We're going to go to Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 19. Verse 34, and Leviticus 19, verse 34 was, that's Exodus, says, The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you are aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Who is the alien? Well, we're not talking about people from outer space. We're talking about the visitors to your country, the visitors to your town, those who are from outside your comfort zone, outside your culture. Jesus says, I don't want you just to love your brother or sister who sits next to you and shares these things with you. I don't just want you to love your neighbour who you've spent a lot of time with and have gotten to know a bit better. I want you to love those people outside of that. Those people who are visitors, those people you don't spend a lot of time with, those people you don't have a lot in common with. I want you to love them. But Jesus doesn't stop there, does he? Flick over to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. And Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Tough call, God. Tough call, Jesus. Love your enemy. Love those who persecute you? You do it, God. Oh, guess what? He did and does. He loves his enemies. He prays for those who persecute you. He does it on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. He dies on the cross not for the... For the he came not for the healthy. He came for the what? For the sick, for those who are distant from him. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies of God, Christ died for us. God loves. Therefore, if I'm a part of God's kingdom, I need to love. If I'm going to be in a right relationship with God, I need to be in a right relationship, not just with my brother and sister here in this building, not just with my brother and sister in the wider church, not just with my neighbour who lives beside me and I spend time with, not just with those who are visiting those, those people I don't spend a lot of time with, but my enemies as well. I need to show love and be in a right relationship with each and every person I come in contact with. And even those I don't come in contact with. So we think about the Israel and the Palestinian war, we think about the Ukraines and we think about the Russians and we like to pick sides as to who's right and who's wrong. 
Do you know, it's not about picking sides. Love. Love. Love your enemy. I know people I talk about love all the time. Sorry. But this is the essence of the gospel. This is the essence of the kingdom of God is to love. God isn't just saying, I need you to love. And and once you've got that sorted out, this is going to be your ticket into heaven. No, he's saying, this is heaven. This is what heaven's all about. This is what the kingdom of God's all about, to love. And you're not just going to go through this life. And at the end of this life, if you get it all right, you're going to be in the best place. You're going to experience what heaven's all about. No, I want you to display it now. The kingdom of heaven is now. It's not in its fullness now, but it is here now. And as believers in Jesus Christ, as followers of God, people are going to know that you are followers of God by what characteristic? By your love. People are going to know that you are Christians not by whether you can fill out the checklist that goes by all the the things that Jesus said you've got to do or by all the things that God said you've got to do or by all the things that the church says you've got to do or by all the rules that you made for yourself in order to make yourself self-righteous. No! The only characteristic that people are going to see Jesus in you is by the way you treat each other. You will display your relationship, your right relationship with God by the way you treat each other. And only by that. And if you are not in a right relationship with people, if you find yourself thinking you're better than people, this is why it's important to go through the Beatitudes in order. Because you need to be meek. You need to understand you are no better than the person next to you. That you can't save yourself. You have done nothing which is worthy to save yourself. You need to understand that you are poor in spirit. You need to realize that there is distance between you and God that you cannot fill up. Just as the next person. Just as the worst person that you can think of in your mind. You are as distant from God in your own efforts as they are. But by the grace of God. But by the blood of Jesus. How do you picture people around you? We are all guilty of judging people. We're all guilty of making a perception of people as to what they're like and then treating them differently because of that. Each and every person you come in contact with was created in the image of God. You were created in the image of God. Maybe you haven't displayed the image of God, but you were created originally in the image of God to be God bearers, to to display the goodness of God. Because that is the kingdom of heaven. That his creation would display the goodness of God. That was the Garden of Eden where everything was good and everything praised God. The rocks, the animals, the plants, the people. But we fell. Due to our own desires. But God wants you, he's trying to bring, he's not just trying to bring back, he's going to bring back the kingdom of God in its fullness. He's going to bring back that idea of the Garden of Eden. But he wants you to experience it, not just then in the future when he sorts it all out, but right now, because he's actually sorting it all out through you. You You're not just players in the field who stand around and wait for things to happen. No, no, God wants to use you. And so we pray before for people that they might find encouragement from God and they might be reminded about the goodness of God, uh, especially when they're sick and all the rest of it. 
How? If not through you. Because God uses you to display the goodness of God. You want someone to experience the goodness of God? Show them the goodness of God. First show them that it is alive in you, but then show them the goodness of God. Be the light. Be the salt. Be the ones who God intended you to be. Experience the kingdom of God here and now. And then watch people try. Watch people try to ignore you. Or to ignore what is going on in you. Your righteousness with God. The visible aspect of it is your relationship with people. Now don't get me wrong. You're not loving people. I don't want you to be in a right relationship with people. God doesn't want you to be in a right relationship with people in order that you can then show them heaven in the future. This is not what it's all about. This is not that there is a bigger and better thing to come and I need you to... uh, Now, if I'm going to... My neighbour across the road, if I want to show them what God is all about, um, I've got to love them first and get on side with them. And then once I get on side with them, I can bait and switch and then turn around and give them the, the goodness of God. No, no, your loving them is the goodness of God. Do you understand that? Your actions are the goodness of God. There is no bait and switch. Otherwise, you've got it wrong. That there are better things to come. Yes, there is better things to come, but it starts now. Jesus says if you hunger and thirst for a right relationship with God, you will hunger and thirst for a right relationship with each other. You will see that it is desperate to have a right relationship with God. Not that they won't go to hell. Not because then they'll go to heaven. No, because they will experience what joy is right now. Right now. It's not just the future prospects, it's right now. And he says, if you hunger for those relationships, then you will be filled. The word filled here is, is, is in the terms of um, when you fatten a cow up in order to slaughter it pretty well. You fill it. You don't bloat it. You don't give it the bad food. You, you, just, you fill it to the point where it doesn't need to eat anymore. So it's in its prime condition. God says he will give you what you need to your prime condition. He will give you peace. He will give you joy. He will give you right relationships. And he will give them abundantly to they overflow. You will be satisfied. Filled to the brim, sated. You'll be not wanting more, but desiring more because it is so good. Because this is the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom of heaven. You know, we're not here to promote heaven as being a far off thing, that good things are coming. No, we're here to promote that good things are here. But they're here in Christ. That even though what, whatever hard time you go through in your life, you can have joy and peace now in Christ. It's interesting listening to stories of people who are going through hard times, put through um, old stories of people going through concentration camps. Do they just lie there and say, oh, there's better things to come? No, you see, there's a change in their attitude. The good things are here. You think about those countries that don't have many much money or much food. And they're the most joyful people because they found joy not in the things of this world. They're not hungry and thirsting for for food or for for TVs or for for cars or whatever it is. They're, They're just in a good relationship with God. You can be in a good relationship with God and you will find joy in that relationship with God here and now. But the promise is there are even better things to come. For this is the kingdom of heaven. I wonder what it's like to to step into a congregation like this. For an outsider. Because if 
The kingdom of God is all about good relationships. How do people feel when they step into a, a congregation like this? Do they, see, do they see a whole bunch of people who sort of, these people over here, and they're talking about these people over here, or these people over here, and they're pointing fingers at those people over there? Or do they feel that love? See, walking into a church should be something out of this world. Because this is not something that the world can propose to people. This is not something that the world even pushes to people. It says you're better than anybody else. Just remember that. All these beatitudes are not something you can decide for yourself. They're not something you can make happen yourself. It will only happen through the Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of God is alive and well in this church, then love will be alive and well in this church. <coughs> Relationships with God will be alive and well in this church. And relationships between brothers and sisters will be alive and well in this church. Thanks be to God that from the, the comments of people who come into this church, that's what I hear from them. They come and they feel welcome. But it's not something that just happens. It is because of your relationship with God that it happens. And your relationship with the people around you that it happens. So I'm excited about, I don't know if you can tell that, but I'm excited about the Beatitudes and I'm excited about this kingdom of God which is here and now. Because a burden's been taken from my mind that I have to just push my way through this life. I just have to deal with the hassles that come at me in this life. And I just have to deal with the people that come at me in this life. And eventually things will be better in the end. Because God is promising it will be better now. See, how do you introduce the kingdom of God to somebody if you say, oh, the kingdom of God is fantastic, this, over here, this heaven over here, it's, you, you want to come along to it. When they look at you and they go, but you're just in a murky mud hole over here. If it doesn't make difference now, how are you ever going to tell them about the difference it's going to make then? There's so much more I could say, but I think it's time I shut up. <laughs> thanks Jackie let's pray Father may your scriptures may your words be alive in us may you continually help us to see afresh your words your kingdom may we be constantly reminded of your love for us that came not because we deserved it but because you are a mighty and wonderful creator who loves and cares for your creation and would go to the ends of the earth to make a way for us to enjoy you. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who makes the way possible for us. We aren't perfect. And in these bodies, we will never be perfect. But we are perfected in your sight because of Jesus. Father, help us to see our neighbours, our friends, our, the aliens in this country, our enemies in a different light. Help them to see them not as people who grate against us and have the wrong ideas, but people who are as lost as we once were and who desperately need to know the goodness that comes from following you. Father, may we be a light on a hill. May we be the salt of the earth. And may we start here amongst our brothers and sisters, loving them and being concerned for them and caring for them and building them up that through your church, the world may know that you are God. Father, thank you for sharing your kingdom with us. And may we be citizens who see the value in God and live it. And I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. We're going to close by singing